fundraiser uh, for the foundation, which then in turn benefits um, most, many of our staff in the district. So if you're available, um, come check it out. Thank you, Dr. Kolar. Any other updates? Okay, let's move on to section three, consent agenda. Item moved for discussion. The consent items as of November 1st are listed. We may add additional agenda items throughout the meeting. Are there any items that board members would want removed? Okay. So section four, education, Dr. Kolar, please. Thank you, Mrs. Evans Brockett. Item 4.01 is our education update, so I will turn it over to Mrs. Smith. Good evening, everyone. Just a couple of things this evening. Uh, you heard Mrs. Mayers mention a little bit about tomorrow's activities. I'll share a little bit more about that. Parent-teacher conferences, an update on our comprehensive plan, and then the majority of my presentation will be enrollment comparisons, and Dr. Russell will end with health and safety plan updates. So tomorrow is our um, East, and so we are repeating that now. This them together at East yet, but we have a lot of great offerings. You can see the schedule. There are three sessions that they will participate in, and they have choice from over 45 different workshops. We have some staff wellness activities, time to complete our climate survey, and then these are just a few of the highlighted workshops. Everything is aligned to one of our district focus, and the third one is escaping me right now. Um, Dr. Russell already shared a little bit about that. The only thing that I will virtually if a parent chooses to request that. Um, and these are obviously opportunities for our families and our teachers and our students in some cases to really talk together about how they're doing not only academically but socially and emotionally. And then our comprehensive plan um, update. Dr. Russell talked to you about our climate surveys um, that are in the next couple of weeks. We'll have some information to share about those. And it's exciting to announce to you that we received pandemic, and these were supposed to be due um, in February and March. Dr. Boyd, did you want to present these? Okay. The due date is now July 31st. So we will take a look at our maps. So we were able to engage a little bit with some parents, teachers, and administrators, and board members uh, to begin that conversation. But again, we will adjust that timeline to align with the submission to PDE for July 31st. And then the next slide is really just a reminder again about the special education roundtables that are scheduled for this year, as well as the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit Local Task Force meetings. So it's just a reminder for everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Boyd. So then moving into our enrollment comparisons, typically at this time of year, uh, we use our enrollment numbers from October every year, and we do some comparisons. So I just shared a couple of things here with you. You can see our enrollment history since October of 2015 on the chart on the left. We have decreased slightly over 500 students in those six years. And on the right, you can just see each of the Octobers broken out by grade level for the last three years. So I'm showing you pre-pandemic, which was October 2019. And then you can see in the midst of the pandemic and now um, this past October. So we had um, you know, a decrease of about 250 students from 19 to 20, but we've stayed pretty um, relatively close then in the last two years. Uh, interested in virtual students, obviously we had a larger number of virtual students in October of 2020, and you can see those numbers, the percentage of virtual students, whether they were in PV virtual last year or they were in our, um, our own virtual that we had, similar to our Viking Academy this year. Those numbers are much larger in October 2020, and then you can see how they have decreased into October 2021 by grade. Um, and these are students enrolled in virtual instruction here at PV, meaning in our Viking Academy, whether taught by our teachers or through those third-party vendors. And homeschool, we had looked at this last year just to see, you know, with the pandemic, we were wondering where have some of our students gone. So you can see we did have an increase from 19 to 20, um, but it has stayed pretty, you know, relatively similar, slight decrease into this school year. About 88 students are still participating in homeschool. 
And then it's always um, interested to look at our charter school comparisons. So this gives you the charter schools, whether they are brick and mortar or cyber, and how many students they have had enrolled at the elementary or secondary level for the past three years. Um, and again, you'll notice a large increase from 2019 to 2020, but now you can see that about 25 or so students we have decreased as we moved into this year. And I, I was really interested in, well, what, where did those kids go? Um, so I just, I tried to look at each student. Some of them were a little bit harder to find what their enrollment history was. But of those 109 um, from last year to this year, five of those students graduated. One decided to enroll in non-public this year. Two of those students we were able to garner back through our own Viking Academy, our virtual school. 11 of them decided to return to Perkiomen Valley in-person classrooms. We also did have two students who were not in Cyber Charter last year who decided to go to Cyber Charter this year. And for the majority of the rest of the students, if they were in Cyber Charter, they continued in a Cyber Charter this year. And Dr. Russell, I'll turn it over to you for health and safety. Thank you, Mrs. Smith. And I'd like to call out one proposed revision to our health and safety plan, and that's really around the test to stay program that was recently approved by the county or is underway to be approved by their board this month. And the test to stay program represents a modified quarantine. And what it does is if a student or staff member is identified as a close contact in the school setting and they are unvaccinated, if they agree to participate in testing on an every other day basis from day one of notification or realization through day seven, they don't have to quarantine or stay out of school. And that's been a high priority for us, keeping kids in school. So this is another step that the county has taken to support our efforts to do that based on what they're realizing when students are quarantined and the number of students that ultimately emerge as positives from those quarantined students. It hasn't been very many. Now, there are certain criteria that have to be met. Close contact must occur here on on school property or in the school setting, students must be masked as well. If they're vaccinated, they don't have to worry about this. It's unvaccinated individuals. And then they have to, of course, agree to the testing on an every other day basis. And if they remain negative as a part, as a result of the rapid antigen testing every other day, they don't have to stay out of school for that quarantine period. They can continue to come to school getting that test every other day wearing their mask. So um, I have proposed this as part of an update to our health and safety plan. And again, just look forward to supporting our students in this way while at the same time maintaining the health and safety of our school community. Happy to take questions if there are any on this. Are there any board questions? Ms. Lofton. Dr. Russell, for the parameters of the test to stay program, it is sounding to me like those are being dictated by the county. So it is up to the board whether or not we are accepting the parameters that the county has laid out as far as timing of testing and who has to quarantine when and under what conditions or are those um, decisions that the board has latitude over? They are determining those criteria with the exception of whether or not we incorporate staff. That is something that is left to a local decision. But the other criteria have been established by the county. Okay, so our only decision point then really around it is whether or not we want to incorporate it into our health and safety plan and whether or not we want to allow ta staff as well as students to be part of the program. That's correct, and I am recommending staff be included so that they would then participate in that modified quarantine and not have to stay out of school for that period of time. They must be mask wearers, regular mask wearers, and they must agree to that testing every other day. Yes. Any other questions? No other questions. You got the crazy. Okay, thank you. Back to Dr. Kohler. Okay, item 4.02. I'm sorry, I actually had a question about something previous. About education. Yeah. Okay, yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, I apologize. I thought you were asking about. Um, and actually, I wanted to know, um, Dr. Boyd, could you 
just explain a little bit what the MCIU task force meetings would be, what they might entail, and, and why a parent might want to go to that, what we might learn from that? Certainly. So the MCIU task force is designed um, to connect school districts with families and resources uh, throughout the county. And what they've done this year, I apologize, it feels like I'm echoing a little bit, so I'll step back. Is that better? Okay. Um, what they've done this year is they've established uh, topics for each of their meetings. And I do apologize, I don't have them in front of me. I can certainly provide that to the board next week. But there are topics where they're bringing in some guest speakers. And what they're, they're trying to do is they're trying to garner uh, more, more, more participation on the part of parents so that families across the county are aware of the resources that can support them and their children through school age as well as post-secondary. So as students transition beyond high school, what are the supports and services that are there and accessible for families? So it is designed, again, to connect school districts, parents, and community resources uh, for students that receive special education supports and services. Would it be possible just to put on the special education page maybe the date and then what the topic is? Uh, you know, yes. Like, that would be really helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Are there any other questions on the education presentation? Okay, now we'll go back to Dr. Kohler. Okay, item 4.02 is the enrollment report for November. Mrs. Smith, did you have anything to add to what you've already shared? No, nothing to add this evening. Moving on to item 4.03, the recommended action will be a motion to approve the following field trip as reviewed and forwarded by building principals and district administration. This is a high school wrestling trip with a cost to the district of $1,500. Any comments or questions? Mrs. Lofton. I am curious what it is about this specific trip that the board is being asked to pay for in comparison to some of the academic trips that students are being asked to pay for. And I'm thinking, for example, the um, AP environment uh, trip that they, there's an overnight trip as well as in um, middle school, I believe there is an overnight science trip that students are asked to pay for. So I'm curious why um, families pay out of pocket for some of the academic overnight trips, but the board is being requested to pay for a wrestling overnight trip. So this particular trip, it, it is an overnight trip, and the $1,500 is for their lodging and transportation, which I believe because it is, um, you know, one of the tournaments that they participate in, Mr. Felty has this included in the athletic budget. So it was something that was already part of the budget that they have planned to attend. So in previous years, has the wrestling team um, participated in this event? You know what, I can't, I'm not for sure on that, on this exact particular one. I know that we, you know, brought it forth because of the overnight piece and the approval needed for that. I can't, I could ask Mr. Felty. Yeah, I'd be curious to know the history as to who was, uh, it's my understanding that there were previous overnight wrestling trips, but I'm curious who paid for that. And, you know, again, why the board is being asked to pay for an athletic trip where families are paying out of pocket for academic trips. We can get more information. Any other board questions? Okay, so since we're gonna wait for more information, let's leave this item off of consent. Item 4.04, .04, the recommended action is a motion to approve the district assessment schedule as reviewed by the Education Assessment Committee as presented. Any questions or comments? Okay, we'll move that one to consent. Item 4.05, the recommended action is a motion to approve an exception to policy 202, eligibility of non-resident students to allow a family to participate in Viking Academy for the second semester of the 2021-2022 school year due to the parents' temporary relocation. Any questions?
Okay, then we will move that item to consent. Item 4.06 will be a motion to approve an exception to policy 214, class rank. Questions or comments? I have a question. Um, I'm wondering why we aren't tracking class rank now. Um, Is that correct? Am I misunderstanding that? No, it was a change to policy a number of years ago. Okay. Okay, so it's been, it's been, we've had this policy for a couple of years. Okay. Yeah. Mrs. Mayors, if I may, I would like to add though that uh, as part of the policy revision, this happened several years ago, it was discussed at Education Committee, and this is where we've landed. If a college or university requests the class rank for a particular student applying there, the counseling center provides that. However, it is, not, it is not something that is shared with students in the manner it was several years ago, and that's really in an effort to avoid the competition that sometimes um, became somewhat unhealthy. Okay, thank you for clarifying. As long as schools can get that information, that's great. Thank you. Mrs. Lofton. I have a question to follow on to that. So it was my understanding that part of the reason why we would continue to track class rank was because there were schools who wanted it, but also because there were some um, scholarship opportunities for which you have to be within a certain percentile of your class rank. So how would a student know whether or not they fit the criteria for a scholarship that they might be applying for? Or do they just not know and they just are, have to apply blindly? Um, based on a, a question posed by a parent, I had opined to Dr. Russell that the information's available to parent upon request. Then why do we have to vote to as an exception for them to receive that information right now the current language in policy 214 stipulates that it will not be provided that it will only be provided to colleges and universities that request it in response to a common application or an opportunity for a scholarship that a student learns about they may not know their class rank but the college or university can ask for that and get that information and have it be considered as part of that application process for the student. So the language in the policy right now indicates that we should not be giving out this information, that only colleges or universities can get that. So Mrs. Smith and I are talking about bringing the policy back to policy committee for consideration and conversation based on this, this tension between FERPA and the policy as written. Could I just add that it, I think part of why it's coming up this year is this is the first graduating class that this, this policy is applicable to. Mm -hmm. So there was kind of a phase in process to the policy and it begins with the class of 2022. Okay, um, if there's no other comments, are we comfortable moving item 4.06 to consent? Okay, so we'll move that to consent. Item 4.07 will be a motion to approve the 2021-2022 Health and Safety Plan version 10 as presented. Any questions? Okay, we'll move that to consent. And item 4.08 will be a motion to approve the 2021-2022 Athletic Health and Safety Plan version 7 as presented. Any questions? Okay, we'll move that to consent as well, and that concludes section four. Thank you, Dr. Kolar. We'll move on to section five, business. Mr. Doerr, please. Thank you, Ms. Sevens Brockett. 5.01, finance update. Mr. Weaver, you're up.
Good evening, everybody. We have a real quick finance update with a lot of information inside of it. So we'll get right to the uh, general fund audit results. These are hot off the press. I did receive these on Friday. Mrs. Hurd and I had a conversation, telephone conversation over the weekend and with Mr. Carl again, or Mr. Hogan this, uh, this today as well. Um, some key ingredients to these numbers, as has been predicted in the projection, and again, I'd like to uh, thank Mrs. Hurd for her phenomenal job that she's been doing behind the scenes for the projection of our revenues and expenditures. We do them in tandem. Um, but Amy really has a, a fantastic grasp on the numbers as they go through on a day-to-day -day transaction, and that really helps us when we create our projections. The bottom line is that our projection is that we are now at 803524 as a positive over our cap, our 8% cap, which, again, we were predicting somewhere in the neighborhood of 740 to 750000 So. At the end of the day, in a $115 million plus budget, considering all the factors that go into it, the fact that we were within $50,000 of our projection is just fantastic, and I'm all struck by the work that goes into that. So, Amy, thank you very much. Um, some key components to this. Now we have brought in the impact of the COVID monies, the COVID grant monies, and you can see that the revenues were over the budget essentially because of the recognition of the COVID. Remember, they're matching grants. So the revenue side equals the expenditure side for the grant portion, the federal grant portion, and the earned income taxes, which you know that I have a fascination with and we've been tracking in the finance committee for years at this point in time. We have a really good handle on that. Um, and th those uh, earned income taxes simply outpaced our budget because we had insulated ourselves from a COVID uh, impact, which never happened, thankfully, and the economy kept on going. Um, one of the other key factors uh, was the fact that, and we talked about this in the Finance Committee, that uh, our follow-up conversation with Berkheimer Associates uh, uncovered something that we really probably hadn't thought of, which is the fact that many people are not working in the city, so they are working from home. So when they do that, we gain the direct benefit because they pay their taxes here then instead of paying it in the city. So that was a, a, an influence and a positive influence on our earned income taxes on the revenue side. On the expenditure side, two things. The first is, of course, the COVID match of the expenditure for the federal portion. And remember, we also have our COVID reserve. When we dip into our COVID reserves, those monies are not matched. Those are unbudgeted, but yet those are already compensated for in the, in the COVID reserve. So that's a drawdown on the COVID reserve to show that number. So when we look at our total overall expenditures, the $803,000 over the 8% max is exactly, pretty much exactly where we thought we'd end up. A couple of other items there that we will drill down over the next finance committee meetings and share that out to the board, of course, is our fund balances, how are we doing? You can tell there that overall our, um, our unassigned fund balance at 10206202 is over our 8% cap of this year's expenditures. So that is why we need to uh, work on our 851,672, essentially. So positive information and news all around, as predicted, as we've all been keeping track of for at least six, seven months for how we would end up. Um, we will continue to move forward with this. Uh, of course, Carl Hogan from BBD LLP comes in uh, January to review the actual big, thick general purpose financial statements. Um, so we, overall, good information to share with the board. Because of the fact that we are over the 8%, we have to have a recommendation on what we're going to do with those monies. So the 851672 we are recommending from the business office to move that over into, on a, into the uh, committed to capital projects. We do know with Mr. Fabrizio being here, it's a new way to look at things. We have a lot of capital projects that we are uh, discovering, uh, so to speak, and we have a huge task at hand. So our recommendation would be to move that money over the 8% now that we know what those numbers are into the committed for capital projects. Mr. Moran is up next. Oh, any questions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Moran. Okay. Thank you. That's Actually, one you can hold on to that. Yeah, it's only one slide. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, 
this is our annual true up class. Uh, it feels like uh, not too long ago that Mr. Allbach uh, was sharing this uh, from last year and I was able to listen in. Uh, tells you how quickly time goes. As Mr. Weaver uh, prepares for the upcoming budget, uh, it's always important uh, that we look back and determine do we have any cost savings uh, when we compare our 21-22 um, staff, uh, staffing budget compared to any staffing changes or cost savings that we have due to staffing changes from resignations to retirements to also extended leave of absences. Um, so what you see this evening, uh, if you look at the left-hand side, uh, we're going to start off. Uh, we have 16 professional staff uh, members uh, that have changed over uh, last year. And this data looks at anyone who has left the district um, during last school year or at the end of last school year. And then the difference in staffing that we've hired uh, compared to those that have left. Um, so you'll notice that we have 16 uh, individuals or professional staff members um, that left the district. And then you can see on the right-hand side, uh, the replaced contract teacher. And that gives you the cost difference um, in those that we've hired. I think one thing that you know, we notice in PV over the past few years, and this year is no exception, um, when we're hiring staff members, uh, the majority of our staff members have experience you know, as they come into our district. Um, so out of the 16 individuals uh, that were hired, uh, two are new staff members, meaning they have zero years of experience when we hired them. We had five individuals that had one to three years experience, uh, three individuals that had four to six years of experience, and then six individuals that had seven plus years um, of experience. So as we you know, look to replace um, staff members, whether it's a resignation or retirement, um, it's, it's safe to say that you know, we're finding individuals that have experience um, and they're highly qualified as we bring them into the classroom to support our students. Overall, we had $317,639 um, in a cost difference um, in the plus uh, when we compare individuals that left the district to those that were hired uh, for this coming school year. Just below that, you can see new uh, long-term substitutes. Um, so also in, included in the calculation, uh, we look at how many individuals do we have currently this school year um, who might be out on extended leave, um, considered long-term substitutes that come in and replace them, and is there a cost difference based on the salary of the long-term substitute versus that was, that was budgeted for the 21-22 school year? You can see right now for the first semester, we have three individuals who are on long-term leave. Uh, and there's a cost difference of $65,794. So when you add those two um, together, we have $383,433 of cost savings uh, for professional staff members. If we move over to the right-hand side, uh, the top section, um, you'll see these are our administrative or confidential supervisory uh, positions. And we had three positions where we saw a change, um, and that cost difference was a negative $12,582. When we add all that up, um, we see a total savings of all professional, administrative, and confidential supervisory positions of $370,851. Um, and that's helpful for us as we look at the next year's budget uh, preparation uh, that we know we do have some um, savings uh, that we can apply. Any questions on the data that was presented? This is Lofton. This is just a point of clarification for my understanding, and this is for our long-term substitutes. It's saying that they're re replacing contract employees, but they're really filling in for contract employees. Is that correct? Correct. They're temporarily filling in or replacing them uh, on a temporary basis. Okay, and so that's a six-month time frame, and so that's why you were seeing half of the amount from up above. Correct. So they are, they're prorated. So if you look at, on the left-hand side, you can see, like, Number one, it says bachelor step five. Um, that's a substitute that we brought in. Um, it's a prorated uh, half a salary, so $26,638 compared to the individual that is on leave um, at a prorated salary of $51,070. Okay. So this isn't a projected ongoing savings. It's just a savings from this one, one year. One time. Just a one time. Yes. Okay. And then we'll also have some additional long-term substitute positions for second semester. Uh, but when we do these projections or, or these cost savings, it's only including the first semester because that's what we're currently in. Any other questions? 
Okay, thank you. And I just want to also uh, just acknowledge uh, and recognize uh, Mrs. Hurd and Mr. Weaver on their assistance in putting the data together. Um, as you know, um, you know, this is important and for us to, to keep a running total um, of the true up cost um, as we move forward for this school year. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moran. Uh, one of the other things is um, philosophically, over the years we have um, utilized this figure moving forward from a flexibility perspective. Last year, whenever we uh, finished up the true, the true up cost, we actually took them out of the budgetary process. And what we discovered was that kind of limited administration as we went forward with um, moving forward to address the needs at that time. So rather than take those dollars directly out of the budget like we did, like I recommended last year, I'm now recommending with the board's approval to keep that number there and to use it, utilize it as we have previously which was we utilize that as stopgap measures and flexible dollars moving forward for uh, and to address additional things moving forward in the uh, following fiscal year. So I am recommending at this point in time that we do not uh, touch those numbers and actually physically remove them at this time. Last year, different story. Uh, I think I learned my lesson. Uh, so we're gonna request that the school board provide us with that ability to keep those dollars as a flexible way to address. Uh, any concerns moving forward for 22-23. Um, Mr. Weaver, can you remind me, I, when we were looking at positions this previous budgetary time, we, there was some discussion of the true up costs that were, we had already recognized some true up costs and we're gonna use them for these positions. So has any of that money already been used for positions that we hired for this year so luckily that is a very clear answer because we removed it from the budget last year so for this year's but true up costs we'll talk about that as we move forward with our budgetary process unlike last year i took that ability away from everybody and just took it right out of the budget um, for good or for bad but um, so I, again i learned my lesson with that but that's a really good question mrs evans brockett and that is uh, much debate um, and so I've learned. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Okay, and of course, our monthly uh, review of our COVID grant monies, where we're at right now, you can see that uh, we've updated our numbers uh, to reflect. Uh, we, we meet on a weekly basis. Uh, Mrs. Smith, myself, Mrs. Hurd, Mr. Ganesh, sometimes Dr. Russell. It depends on how busy she is. Um, but uh, it is very important that we continue to meet to keep track of these uh, ever-changing grant dollar figures moving forward. So um, again, just to get it on the record. So that's kind of where we're at. Mrs. Lofton. Oh, sorry. I have a question about the totals here and I'm wondering how the total spent plus the balance to spend does not add up to the total grant amount. And there's that one cell in the middle, the 885, it's got a little green comment thing in the corner and I'm thinking maybe that didn't get added into the total, but I'm just yeah, just okay. looking at this and thinking something funky is happening with the Excel spreadsheet. Okay, I appreciate that. And yes, obviously that can't be that way. So uh, I'll, I'll figure that out and get a revised figure in the updated presentation. Thank you. Regardless, the balance to spend is correct. Mm. So, I yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the balance to spend, the 623000 is correct, but I've got to fix those numbers and make sure. My apologies. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Thank you. Moving on, 5.02, there are no grants or donations for November. 5.03 is on consent. 5.04, it's a motion to approve Breslin Architects to provide engineering services associated with an outdoor classroom and greenhouse project at Middle School East and West at a cost of $4,000 for base at an hourly rate of $130 to $220. Costs will be charged to the committed for capital projects. Any questions? Okay, if we can move that to consent, please. Oh, did you have a question? Ms. White. I just was wondering out of curiosity if a date has been put on the calendar to accomplish this or was it pending our approval? 
this was uh, pending, pending our approval, and I know Mr. Fabrizio is back there anxious to get moving with this. Okay, can we put on consent, please? Okay, 5.05. It's a motion to approve a change order for Gilmore and Associates, New Britain, PA, to conduct additional study information for the south circulation issue, the high school pork chop, and campus and KG Road intersection in the amount of $33,800. Any questions? Mrs. Lofton. When we talked about this, I think it was maybe in finance committee, I recall having a discussion that we also wanted to look at the possibility of adding bikes into the circulation at the high school into our um, traffic safety study. And I'm not seeing that in this change order. So I'm curious where that wound up. So the change order was from the original uh, request without the bike in there, we can go back and ask them to uh, see if they will uh, provide that bike study. We also don't know if they're the proper people to be doing that um, because we wanted to reach out to the county as well. So I guess my question around this is we're talking about adding in, uh, adjusting some of the sidewalks and crosswalk areas and I'm imagining that bringing bikes onto campus could influence our need for crosswalks and or um, bike paths. And so I would think that we would want to be looking at that comprehensively. So if that's a separate study, I imagine that could be done, but I would think we would want to be looking at all the modes of transportation together if the board does agree with the idea that we have students biking to school. That's a really good question. Um, I'd hate to hold this up and I'd like to move forward with this. Uh, we can call tomorrow and find out and then have an adjustment on for next Monday if, if it's if it pleases the board. That sounds good. Thank you. Mrs. Mayors. Thank you. So would that also include looking at, um, like we had talked with Mr. Miller about, sorry, about st students crossing from PV High School to the local pizza shop and looking at what might we do? That would also be included, Mr. Miller, is that correct? Okay, thank you. So leave this off consent for now, okay. 5.06, it's a motion to approve an agreement with Leonard con Contractors for Snow Removal Services at Skipback, Schwenksville, and South Elementary Schools for the 2021-2022 school year. Any questions? Okay, if we can move that to consent, please. 5.07, it's a motion to approve an agreement with Leonard Contractors to remove and reconstruct concrete steps with two steel pipe handrails at the Keenan Stadium stairs gate F at a cost not to exceed $14,145. Any questions? Okay, if we can move to consent, please. 5.08 is a motion to approve the purchase of three F-350 trucks at a co-star's price of $40,650 per truck, total cost of $121,950 plus fees. Any questions? Mrs. Lofton. I'm wondering if this is an item that we should approve tonight. When I'm looking at the quote, it is dated October 18th, and then it says at the top in red, Board is cutting off the 2022 ordering in three weeks, assuming it's not cut off earlier. So we need to send them your approval before the ordering gets cut off. And since it's already two weeks out from the time that this quote was provided, I'm thinking we're probably, it might be useful to approve this now. Considering the lead time. Can we do that, Ms. Tubers? Okay. All right, I still move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Are there any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 5.09 is a placeholder for next week. 5.10 is a budget update. Mr. Weaver, you're up again.
Thank you for the opportunity to prevent, uh, present the first look uh, revenues numbers. Uh, and again, thank you for the movement on the trucks. Uh, Mr. Fabrizio is very, very happy about that. I can tell you that. I'm sure. Yes. Okay, so um, not to, so for the finance committee uh, members, we're gonna reiterate a little bit of this, uh, but I feel that it's important that we do a little bit of due diligence uh, from a full school board perspective, uh, because obviously it's one of the main components of what school boards do, that and policy. Um, so just to hit the high notes, it's a 1% increase budget year to budget year for revenues, local, state, and federal revenues as presented. Key components, uh, the recognition of additional earned income tax for budgetary purposes, again, substantiated with information from Berkheimer Associates to help us make that projected number. Remember that state sources are not technically updated until the governor provides his or her budget come February, um, with the exception of FICA and PEASERS, which are driven by a component of the salary expenditures because of 50% of the revenue slide coming back on the expenditures and some other minor adjustments for state subsidies due to actual recognition of revenue performances over the past couple of years. And remember for federal monies, outside of when we actually show them, we tend not to because that's the guidance that PASBO and PSBA has provided that we are not to show those from a budgetary perspective and we recognize them when they're actually spent from a matching perspective, revenues and expenditures. Drill down a little bit on the local revenues. The real estate tax collection is still strong at 96.5%. Again, that is an output of performance, and so there's no need to change that. We talk about other local tax areas, confirm consistency for security for us making these decisions moving forward for uh, budgetary purposes. Increase in interest earnings is recognized, but remember it's a small component because when you go from a 0.01 to a 0.02 or a 0.03, it looks like a large increase. The reality is, is that it's going up by 100% or 200%, but it's still such a small interest earnings number and percentage that overall it's not driving that tremendous amount of revenue stream to consider. And we are recognizing that things tend to get back to normal from an other local income perspective, mainly about rental incomes as we go full bore now with the new uh, rental software, the turf fields, we are getting lots of inquiries from local organizational units to utilize these turf fields. So it's looking promising from that perspective as one little component of the local revenue pre presented. State monies, again, here's a little bit of a drill down Special education, you can see a, an increase based upon the services that we continue to provide. Um, the biggest deduction there is the rental reimbursement. That's a negative 445,000. Remember what that is, is that is a component of the state share of our debt service. Years ago, when we had debt, uh, when we issued debt, the state shared in the cost of that. So if we would pay $10 million, depending upon a bond issue, that would be rated and we would get a reimbursement percentage of 17% or 24% with all the variables that went into that. Well, now, since we've had several years of refunding opportunities, those bond issues have now gone away. And once we refund them, they're no longer eligible for that rental reimbursement. So that is a reflection of the fact that now with our debt service profile, we have fewer and fewer debt services that are actually subject to this rental reimbursement. So we have to reflect that. And again, you can look at the performance, the actual figures now at 303,648 in that column versus uh, the actual budgeted figure. So we've got to reflect that and show that. It's a bad thing on the revenue side. The good thing is, is that that's a reflection of the fact that we took advantage of, of refunding opportunities. So we're actually paying less debt service or keeping that uh, tight profile of debt service that we like within an 11 year call date. So that's a good thing um, overall, but it does hurt our, our revenues a little bit. Of course, retirement and FICA, those items are based upon two factors. Obviously the salaries that go in on one side and the, uh, the rate that is to be certified in December. So we are still working off of a PEASERS rate that is 34.95, that's from last year. That will not be certified until December. So um, that number will be adjusted in December, that'll be a big deal. Expect that number to go up, okay? 
that's a revenue, but also expect the expenditures to go up twice as much. And federal monies, again, because of the recommendation through DeVasbo and pa or PASBO and PSBA, um, we're not recognizing any other non-normal federal monies. We're not recognizing any COVID monies in our budget. We'll recognize them in actuals, but not in our budget. Okay, support for our earned income tax. So that earned income tax figure is at 13.7. And again, you can see the growth over the past couple of years. So this particular year, the spreadsheet on the right you've seen before, this is our daily earned income tax, um, which then gets uh, summarized and placed together, compressed for a year to date, month, month to date and year to date process on how we track our earned income. Uh, Berkheimer Associates, we asked them for a projection and you can see here right from the letter, their projection, they're somewhere around 13.7. Hence, that's why we feel confident going out with a 13.7. Um, keep in mind that that little nugget of what they do provide is that simple fact that I shared before, that we have people that used to work in the city that are now working at home. We don't know when that's gonna change. We don't know how that's gonna work, but they will eventually, perhaps, go back to the city. And once they do, their earned income tax that they pay here will then shift to the city. They'll pay more in the city the school district does get a little bit of that back in terms of Sterling Act. Sterling Act tax is only for four counties, and I believe uh, Allegheny County, where people that tend to work in the cities, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, pay higher local taxes. Mr. Subers, I could be wrong about that one, but I do know the four counties around Philadelphia, we do get the benefit of a Sterling tax. We apply a separate um, form and say, these amount of monies are subject to the Sterling tax. They, we then get a secondary supplement to our base earned income tax figures in addition to that that we match up. Speaking of forecast five, there are a couple of other interesting slides. And again, we'll try to work more and more of those in as we continue to move forward. This slide represents 2014 to 2020 budget to actual revenues, total revenues. Um, and again, you can see here that what we're doing is we're tracking what our variances are. Where did we mess up? Why did we mess up? And each one of these slides, you can drill down a little bit further and find out where those uh, mis missteps were, so to speak. So for instance, we budgeted in 2019 this figure, and we actually ended up 2.37% higher. 2.97%, I can't read that, I'm sorry. But the, the important part is we can go in there and we can hover over that in a live scenario and then it, we can drill down even further to find out where those individual line items were that, f that made us actually perform better than what our budgetary was. Average variance over those years, 2.06%. Again, many of those figures are driven by the earned income tax, right? Because we've seen the earned income tax growth over the years, budget to actual. Here's just specifically on the local revenues. Remember that uh, previous slide was all revenues. Now it's just local revenues, which again, you can tell the variance over the years is about 1.51%. But remember in 2020, what we budgeted is almost actually what we ended up with. That's June 30, 2020, last fiscal year. So two fiscal years ago, I'm sorry. So again, that gives us areas that we can go and look at if we're interested and maybe drill down a little bit further and find out where the, some of those areas were. So again, it's a tool to help us um, figure out areas that we can get better in because we can always get better in the way that we budget to actual, but also lead, lend some credence to the fact when we come out with a budgetary figure, this is how oftentimes we're getting it. And what are the odds that we're off? Well, you know, we could always be off a little bit, but our variances have been relatively uh, tight, so to speak, for local revenues. Here's the interest earning uh, conversation. Um, so you can tell that in 1819, we, we create, we had interest on investments of 871,406. Compare that to where we were for 2020, 2021. That's because the interest rates went down from 4% all the way down to 0.01%. We're fighting our way back 
Um, so the possibility is you can see a little growth there for 22-23, about a $60,000 budget to budget growth. That's reflection of where we're at for actual unaudited figure of 144,000. That gives you a little bit of an insight on how we're doing this. Remember, this is an alternative revenue source for us, which it's great if those monies can come in because um, that's based upon the market and the market can drive some additional revenue sources to offset additional expenditures. That's kind of how we look at that. A couple other things to think about. How long are we gonna be in this economic impact for the pandemic? Don't know, nobody really knows, but we'll try to continue to be conservative, but yet reflect some of those areas like an interest earning, if those rates would go up even slightly, we would, we would show a huge increase in dollars from where we were budget year to budget year. So maybe instead of 144, maybe if the, if the rate goes up a couple of tenths of a percent, maybe we can get to 200,000, all right? So that would help in that process. As the budget process goes on, we'll recognize more and more of these areas as we feel uh, committed and firm on a lot of these numbers. And I know the board, board members know that. So the next budget steps, obviously we've approved the resolution uh, to be at or below 3.4%. The equal sign comes on December 6th. And we will continue to have a capital projects presentation. We move that back to December. That was going to be in November, uh, the next week's meeting. But this gives uh, Mr. Fabrizio a little bit more time to get accustomed to our master facility uh, plan, the athletics master facility plan from a couple of years ago, and how they all connect and interconnect and what progress we've made over time. The PEASERS rate, we talked about that, will be certified in December, and the governor will give his Commonwealth budget in February. And that's all I have for tonight. Are there any questions? Mr. Dorr. Mr. Wee, we had a presentation a couple months ago about a refunding opportunity, and I feel like it just nothing's happened. We haven't talked about it since then, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. Has, that, has things changed? Things have not changed. Uh, Mrs. Doyle at the time, actually, Jamie did say that uh, she, would she would go away for a little bit and watch and see how the market um, responded over the next couple of months. Um, we are due to talk to her prior to the Thanksgiving break for an update in pre preparation for December. Um, and at that point in time, we'll have to make some decisions uh, from a finance committee perspective to bring it forward to the board. But we have not forgotten about that. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Weaver. That ends my section. Thank you, Mr. Doerr. Moving on to section six, payment of bills, Dr. Weston. Thank you, Mrs. Evans Brockett. Item 6.01, the ratification of bills and payroll and the authorization of payments. And item 6.02, the approval of the Treasury's report and financial statements. Both will be presented for action at our next meeting on November 8th. And that concludes section six. Thank you, Dr. Weston. That takes us on to section seven on professional personnel. Ms. White, please. Thank you, Mrs. Evans Brockett. 7.01, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 are all on consent. 7.08 is an approval of revised job description. It's a motion to request to approve a revised job description for the Supervisor of Health and Wellness position approved May 2021 as presented. Are there any questions? Move that to consent. 7.09 is a request for action. Request for action is a motion to approve the provisional employment of the following administrative personnel pending fulfillment of all statutory requirements. Are there any questions? No, I so move, I'm sorry. Second. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Are there any questions? Aye. Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. 710 is the approval of a memorandum of understanding for IEPs. Recommended action is a motion to approve a memo, memo of understanding between the Perkiomen Valley School District and the Perkiomen Valley Education Association pertaining to mandatory IEP documentation. Are there any questions? 
seeing none, we can move that to consent. And 711 is a placeholder for uh, next week. And that ends my section. Thank you, Ms. White. Takes us to section A on support personnel, Mrs. Roberts. Thank you, Mrs. Evans Brockett. 8.01, 8.03, 8.04, and 8.05 are all on consent. And that concludes my section. Thank you very much. Section nine, governance. Mrs. Mayors, please. Thank you, Mrs. Evans Brockett. Um, the following policies are presented for first reading. 115, career and technical education. 127, assessments. 130, homework. 137, home education. 210.2, medications, 230, public performance by students, 231, overnight trips and class trips, 915, booster support organizations. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to 9.02. Approval to hold a second reading and adopt policies. The recommended action is a motion to hold a second reading and adopt the policies as listed. 006 meetings, 006.2 meeting agendas, 146.1 trauma informed, 218.1 weapons, 218.2 terroristic threats, 236.1 threat assessment, new policy, 247 hazing, 249 bullying and cyberbullying. 252 dating violence, 805 emergency preparedness, 805.2 school security personnel, 903 public participation in board meetings, 916 school volunteers. And I so move. Second. This is not, we're not motioning and second okay, tonight. Sorry. This is, <laughs> yeah, you can ask if anyone has any questions. Does anybody have any questions? So we can move it to okay. consent. Thank you. 9.03, this is a recommended action. It's motions to approve expulsion resolution as presented by district administration and solicitor. And I so move. We have a motion and a second. Are there any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. That ends my section. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mayors. Section 10, closing items. We are down to one audience member, but 10.01 is comments from the audience. All right. 10.02 is comments from board members. Do we have any board comments tonight? Seeing none, 10.03 is our notice of video recording disclaimer. Per policy 006.3, all video recordings are subject to the following disclaimer. The opinions expressed by any members of the public do not necessarily re reflect the views or opinions of the Board of School Directors of the Perkiomen Valley School District and are solely those of the presenter. The Board of School Directors of Perkiomen Valley School District hereby expressly disclaims any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public. Any unauthorized rebroadcasting of any video, audio, and or still image of this meeting is strictly forbidden without the written permission of the Board of School Directors of Perkiom and Valley School District. And prior to adjourning, I will say that we had exec executive session for the pur purpose of real estate and confidential student matter prior to tonight's board meeting. We'll see everyone next week.